Good evening and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I wanna thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will take place on Wednesday, April 6th at 6 p.m. when Nida Tului Semnani will talk about her memoir focused on the Iranian revolution. She will be in conversation with uh, Washington Post reporter, Jason Rezaian. Please mark your calendars and register for this event on the Leon Levy website. And please encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe to our digital mailing list so you can be informed of our upcoming events. But tonight we are gathered for yet another roundtable discussion. This one focused on biographies of radical figures. Our own David Nassau is leading the discussion with four other biographers. Graduate Center Professor Emeritus David Nassau is a founding member of Radical History Review. His most recent book is The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War. In addition, he is the author of prize-winning biographies that have been <coughs> shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize, including The Chief, The Life of William Randolph Hearst, Andrew Carnegie, and The Patriarch the remarkable life and turbulent times of Joseph P. Kennedy. Teresa Mead is Florence B. Sherwood Professor of History and Culture Emerita at Union College, Schenectady, New York. She is the author and editor of several books, but most recently she published a biography, We Don't Become Refugees by Choice. Mia Truskier, Survival and Activism from Occupied Poland to California. Manu Bhagavan is Professor of History, Human Rights, and Public Policy at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, and Senior Fellow at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. His latest work, India and the Cold War, was published in 2019, and he is currently writing a biography of, of Vijaya uh, Lakshmi Pandit, one of the most celebrated women of the 20th century and a pioneer in international diplomacy. Benjamin Talton is the director of the Moreland Spring Arn Research Center at Howard University. He is the author of several books, including most recently, In This Land of Plenty, Mickey Leland and Africa in American Politics, published in 2019, which won the 2020 Wesley Logan Prize and was a finalist for the 2020 Pauli Murray Prize. Brian Peterson is an historian of Africa, specializing in Francophone Africa and the Sahel region. His first book was a grassroots study of rural religious change in Southern Mali under French colonial rule. And his second most recent book is called Thomas Sankara, a revolutionary in Cold War Africa. He teaches at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Please look for all these books at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Our panelists will now be in conversation for about 45 or 50 minutes, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below to type in your questions, and David will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after about one hour or an hour and 10 minutes or so. Again, thanks to Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to my good friend and colleague, David Nassau. David? Thank you, Kai. Um, I'm joined here by four remarkable historians who have decided for reasons they will explain to make the leap or turn to biography. There is, I think, and I admit to being biased here, something special about biographies written by historians. Almost all biographers attempt to place their subjects in historical context, but for too many, the history is a backdrop, a scene setter. For historians, on the other hand, it is an integral, perhaps the integral component in their narratives. 
As biographers, we begin with a life and a times. In constructing our life stories, we put our subjects into relationship with the worlds they are born into and inhabit. As the historian Oscar Hanlon, who both wrote and edit, edited biographies put it, quote, the proper subject of biography is not the complete person or the complete society, but the point at which the two interact. There, the situation and the individual illuminate one another. We will proceed in some sort of chronological order. And I will give a brief introduction to the subjects that our historian biographers have written about. And then we'll, we'll turn to them in chronological order. Teresa Mead, whose biographical subject is Mia Truskier. And as I proceed, interrupt me if I'm mispronouncing something. Mia Truskier, who was born in 1920 into a secular Jewish family and raised in the affluent milieu of interwar Warsaw. Along with her husband, mother, and cousin, she left Poland in April 1940 on the basis of a fake Bulgarian visa purchased on the black market. Denied entry to Switzerland and Italy, the family managed to trade the Bulgarian visa for a 24 hour transit visa to Italy where they stayed during the war. In 1949, they immigrated to the US, first to Nebraska and later California. In the US, Mia Traskier became an activist for other refugees, earning renown in the Bay Area as the oldest refugee of the East Bay Sanctuary Covenant until her death, just short of her 94th birthday, she volunteered to help those fleeing from war, violence, and hardship, mainly from Central America and Haiti. Manu Bhagavan writes about Madame Pandit, whom Eleanor Roosevelt called the most remarkable woman she had ever met. Madame Pandit, as she was known, was a pioneering politician and diplomat celebrated internationally for her brilliance, charm, and glamour. She straddled the 20th century, her own story, intertwining with those of India and the world. She was her country's first woman cabinet member, India's first ambassador to the United Nations, and the first ambassador to the Soviet Union. She was the first woman ambassador to the United States and the first woman elected president of the UN General Assembly. She moved easily in global aristocratic circles, even as she worked tirelessly to improve the lives of millions who were suffering. At the tail end of her career, she stood against her own niece, Indira Gandhi, to put an end to tyranny. The subject of Benjamin Talton's biography is Mickey Leland, a black power era activist who ran for and was elected to the US Congress from Houston, Texas. We need him now. As a congressman and national figure, Leland spearheaded solidarity with African liberation movements. Benjamin Talton situates Leland as a product of the 1960s civil rights and black power movement. And he challenges conceptions of the incompatibility of mainstream and radical politics in the United States. Leland was a powerful proponent of the rights of the marginalized in the US and abroad, particularly within the movement against apartheid in South Africa and the food crises and the people they affected in the Horn of Africa. And finally, Brian Peterson has written a biography of the charismatic revolutionary leader, Thomas Sankara, who rose to power in 1983 in Francophone Burkina Faso in West Africa. 
Sankara quickly became a transnational hero of African youth. As a revolutionary leader, he managed to wipe out corruption, achieve food security, and create a new kind of political architecture that allowed for more direct democracy. He boosted women's roles in government. He fought for gender equality. He was an advocate for environmental justice. He took steps to battle land degradation through mass reforestation. And against the backdrop of Cold War geopolitics, he embodied the principles of non-alignment, courageously challenging global inequality and foreign aggression. For many, his outspokenness and anti-establishment ethos restored a sense of dignity and pride in being, Africa, being African. But after four years of revolutionary change, he spearheaded. His life tragically ended when he was assassinated in a plot supported by foreign powers. After his murder, he became even more popular and emerged as a revolutionary icon for African youth and an inspiration for many on the global political left. These are four radical world historical figures whose voices rang loud during their lives, but of whom we know little about today. They have been forgotten by most, not known by many more. Their voices and messages silenced. Why? What can we learn? These are the questions that our panelists, I hope, will attempt to answer. What can we learn about their lives, the historical moments they inhabited, and the ways in which they tried to make history as Karl Marx reminds us, not under, quote, circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living, including these four remarkable, radical individuals. Our four panelists are distinguished political historians, um, distinguished and published historians. Okay, let's begin with, with Teresa. And then the following questions will be answered in seriatim by our panelists. Um, what made you make the turn to biography? Um, your previous books had not been biographical studies. Did you start out to write a biography or were you pushed to do so? Because this was the best way to present, to narrate, to illuminate, interpret, the history of a particular time and place. And if you care to answer, is this the first and last biography you're gonna write? Or might there be another? Are you so taken with this genre that there'll be another to follow? Teresa? All of us broke out smiling when you asked that, I noticed. <laughs> uh, the, um, this is actually a story about a woman who is not uh, well known at all and the people who knew her remember her but she is not a public figure like the others that are being discussed on this panel and I began to learn about her and she was an old friend of, of uh, I knew her children and I she was a friend of my my husband's uh, and so I just met her in uh, the 1970s and I met her because I was doing research into the Latin American solidarity movement I was wanting to write a book about people who supported the liberation struggles in Central America, particularly Guatemala and El Salvador, and at that time the uh, triumphant Nicaraguan revolution. And I was interested, I'm a Latin American historian, so I began to ask her why she um, became involved with work for refugees. And she was very adamant and she was very passionate about the work she was doing for the East Bay Sanctuary. She was an extremely tiny woman and she had not a loud voice at all, a very, very quiet voice. And she said, I work for refugees because I will never forget what it was like to be a refugee. 
And so I began to ask her about her life and I didn't know much about it. And I didn't know very much about Polish refugees. And she started to tell me about it. And it was so fascinating that then I decided also because she was in her nineties um, that I should take this down. And so my book is not exactly a biography. It's an oral history. And it's an annotated oral history where I insert a lot of what uh, David talks about in terms of the very valuable historical background. Um, the, um, I don't know that I can say much more about her than what you have uh, mentioned already. There were three takeaways, I guess I, I mentioned. She came from a very affluent family. Um, she never talked much about confronting anti-Semitism uh, until she was denied admission to the federal university. And she was denied admission because um, she was a part or she came up against the unspoken quota against Jews. Until that time, she thought that her life was pretty much laid out for her and she was going to become an architect. Uh, she then had to leave Poland and she went to Switzerland and that was where she was in the university. She really, you know, had a life change in September of 1939. Um, and that was when her identity came into conflict with world events. And also a whole series of sometimes very funny, but also very scary events um, as she made a living in uh, Italy during the war, selling Christmas trees and nativity creches to very affluent Pol uh, very affluent Italians. I said, Mia, don't you think that was kind of odd, you know, for a Polish Jews sort of under the radar there and, and kind of hiding out in, in Italy? And she's, well, you know, whatever they wanted, I made for them as long as I could get some money because she just had to get money in any way and she had no work permit. And her husband couldn't really work because he would be more subject to conscription. So it was in that background and that kind of fortification that she came to the United States eventually, first to Nebraska and then to California. And it was then that a progressive person became an activist. And that was somewhat later in life. And she became an activist in the way many people from her generation might have. Uh, her children became anti-war and she uh, then became opposed to the war in Vietnam um, and active within that. She was active in um, housing issues in, in California and um, other causes, but she was mostly active against uh, in aid of refugees. And that was her cause until she died. And I think in that way, she was a little unusual because she saw every refugee, not someone who had a background like hers, people who she understood were treated with very racist exclusion in the United States, mostly those from Haiti and those from Central America. And that was what she worked at until she died. Terrific. Manu, your subject is very, very, very different um, from the moment she was born. She was a public figure uh, in India. And when she died, she was celebrating and a public figure uh, the world over. Can you yeah. tell us more about her? Yes, David, thank you. Um, so. Uh, before I get to that, I just want to briefly just thank you for uh, sharing the panel and your and your introduction and um, and Kai and Thad um, and the Levy Center for hosting and the Radical History Review and our fearless leader Teresa for putting all of this together. So thanks to all of you. Um, so the person I'm working with is known colloquially in the West as Madam Pundit. Um, her full name is Vijay Lakshmi Pundit, um, and she grew up in the public eye um, and lived for most of the duration of the 20th century. She was born in 1900, died in 1990, and uh, her family was were the Nehru's. So her brother uh, was Jawaharlal Nehru, who went on to become India's first prime minister. And her father was a famous barrister in India, very wealthy. And she grew up in kind of a Downton-esque kind of, uh, sorry, Downton Abbey-esque uh, uh, environment with a upstairs downstairs except it was sort of left wing right wing um so yes she, she grew up in the public eye 
um, and then uh, very quickly ascended uh, into um, a public figure in her own right. She became um, the first woman cabinet minister in India and the second in the British Empire <clears throat> following uh, Margaret Bonfield, but, she, but uh, Madame Pandit was the first person um, to hold kind of serious portfolios in self-government and public health. Um, she went on to battle uh, very serious uh, uh, public health crises, public health um, disease outbreaks. In her case, I think it was cholera, but it certainly speaks to the time that we're living in. Um, and uh, she, she sort of did this quite successfully. Um, and she also battled famine in her time. Um, this was all during the colonial period in India. So she was also fighting for Indian independence, working together with figures like Mahatma Gandhi, who was one of her mentors. Uh, she was arrested three times um, before she really then um, sort of became the more well-known figure uh, that she is. I'd like to think of her as the most famous woman none of you have ever heard of. Um, she, uh, she achieved a kind of celebrity in the 20th century that's very hard to describe here in the 21st, since most of us have no recollection of her. Um, she was, for example, named multiple times uh, one of the, uh, to like top 10, equivalent of top 10 lists of the most brilliant women in the world, the most beautiful women in the world, the most admired women in the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it wasn't just these lists about women pioneers, but also because she wound up operating in the field of diplomacy and international affairs, she was one of the world's most celebrated and important uh, diplomatic and international figures um, right in, in the high water mark was the mid 20th century. Let me just give you some quick examples of some big things that she did that maybe might surprise you. She's a bit here like Forrest Gump. Uh, so during the Sudeten crisis, she was there in Czechoslovakia right next door to Lord Runciman during the Runciman mission. Um, and, um, you know, they, they were having conversations. Um, and then uh, she was outside number 10, Downing Street, when Chamberlain declared peace for our time. She was in Italy and arrested uh, for the attempted assassination of Mussolini. Uh, she was... Um, Let's see, she told Kennedy not to go to Dallas um, uh, shortly before he went to Dallas. Um, uh, 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 so this just gives you a, a very quick uh, sort of snapshot of some of the ways she makes all these incredible appearances. Uh, her, her, the person who treated her while she was in the United States uh, turned out to be um, uh, a relation of Rogers and Hammerstein. Uh, so she would get her tickets to go see uh, some of the famous musicals on Broadway uh, on the side. Um, uh, she hung out with Hollywood celebrities like uh, Ingrid Bergman and Roberto Rossellini, whose marriage was falling apart and who she helped uh, um, sort of resolve some of the tensions that was going on there. But there are three really uh, landmark things that she did. I just will touch on these and then pass the baton over, uh, I think, to Ben. Um, the first was that she was instrumental in the founding of the United Nations. She worked closely with the NAACP and Walter White and W.E.B. Du Bois. She led the counter delegation to San Francisco to articulate a very different vision than the great powers had originally intended. Uh, and then that helped shape uh, a possibility for the UN that then she helped make real uh, the following year. So the second thing that she did occurred in 1946 when she stood up against South Africa and its famed leader, Jan Smuts, in a great debate at the United Nations over the treatment of, uh, um, uh, over a bill that sort of created a second, cl second class of citizens. Uh, and she uh, engaged in a lot of verbal jousting there, defeating uh, not just Smuts, but uh, a whole host of other uh, famed and eloquent speakers. And then she finally went toe to toe to toe to toe with him in the General Assembly um, and defeated him in debate, winning a two thirds majority. Um, that is a very significant achievement because that vote uh, became the foundation for human rights at the United Nations. Um, the, uh, the Assistant um, Secretary General then went on to use this as the precedent which allowed for the UN to, to engage in, uh, in um, uh, 
action um, that might take place in member states that goes against uh, sort of the larger the larger ethos. The final thing that she did is perhaps her most important. Um, uh, for a period of time in the 1970s, democracy was in decline and was under threat and in decline in India. Uh, and the person who was leading the charge for that was the Prime Minister of India herself, Indira Gandhi. Uh, Indira Gandhi, for a variety of reasons, grew very concerned about what was going on, and she declared an emergency abrogating the Constitution of India. And when she did that, she assumed sort of authoritarian dictatorial powers. Um, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was her aunt. Uh, but was put was treated as a suspicious character, put under house arrest, surveilled, and so on. Um, for a brief period of time, she was quite scared uh, because her children and all were also impacted. But she ultimately sort of gathered 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 herself together and then led the charge against Indira Gandhi, marshaling domestic and international uh, opprobrium sufficient to force elections. And then Indira Gandhi lost those elections, the emergency ended and democracy was restored. Uh, and so um, these are three of her sort of landmark achievements, um, which I think really helped to define who she is and, and speak to why we might want to spend some time thinking about her again today. Thanks. Terrific. Um, Benjamin, why, how'd you get to Mickey Leland? How did I get to Mickey Leland? And how'd you decide to, to write a biography? Yeah, that's that, and sort of, uh, that's the background story. I'm telling the story of Mickey Leland and his times, but part of it is, is memoir. Part of it is the story of the generation, the years in which I, I, I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s. And like Manu, he was, like Manu said about his figure, uh, that Mickey Leland was larger than life and he, he was, friends with famous people, friends with many politicians around the world, world leaders. But I chose a very narrow way of looking at his life because these were his greatest achievements, which was, was, was in African affairs. And I got to him because I was just fascinated by him. As you said in the outset, my, my first, our first books, our earlier works were very different from what we chose to do here. It wasn't, wasn't biography. But I was just fascinated by, by Leland the figure. And, and, and your setup was very good because when I began, I was really thinking in a very specific way. I was gonna write about Mickey Leland the man and just use the times to shape him. But ultimately what I did after I learned uh, about the many diverse myriad activities that he was engaged with and how he was really shaped by his times and, and a product of his times, uh, that he's a window into these moments. And so if we look at him as an activism in the third and fifth ward of Houston, Texas in the 1960s, we have to look at the politics of those times. What made Houston different than say Birmingham or South side of Chicago or Harlem? So I had to understand those things. I had to teach myself those things. And looking at him as a student in the 1960s at Texas Southern University, as a student organizer, a student leader, I had to understand the politics of HBCUs in that moment and, and student activism broadly against the war against racism, against um, um, fascism. So I had to understand these, these issues. So it wasn't just Leland the individual, but Leland as a window into the times. And similarly, as I, as I trace his rise into electoral politics, first in the Texas legislature in the 1970s, and then in the US Congress in the 1980s, I had to understand those institutions. And the big question became, to what extent is it possible to be a radical activist, someone who aligns himself with the third world, third world not as a region, but as a political position of anti-nuclear proliferation, anti-racism, anti-war, anti-poverty, and standing in solidarity with movements in the global south, whether in Nicaragua or in Grenada or in Southern Africa or in Ethiopia or in Algeria. Can you be a mainstream, so to speak, politician and bring these radical elements with you. And so I thought biography is a very effective way of doing that because it gives you a thread to tie these complex themes together. I think outside of Leland, I could still have written about uh, African-American interests in Southern Africa and in the Horn of Africa during the 1970s and 80s and why that mattered. I could have written about uh, the afterlives of Black radical activists in the 60s and 70s and what are they doing in the 80s and 90s? 
but it becomes very messy. It becomes too discursive, I think. Tying that together around an individual or even a set of individuals, which I intend to do with the next project, tightens it up a little bit, gives us someone to, to grab onto and ride through these different issues with. So as we speak about Reagan and Thatcherism and neoliberalism in the late 1970s and 80s, who's pushing against them? We can talk about a variety of figures, but if we have one that we, that we grab onto, um, it makes it more palatable. I think it also makes it more interesting with this one, as opposed to my first book, which frankly I wrote because I was interested in it, but I had to finish a dissertation. It was kind of a niche. I had to get a job, I had to get tenure. So it's a particular type of book. This is more the book that I wanted to write because it allowed me to deal with diverse issues and, and be creative and try to write to a broader audience and not just uh, think about footnoting so much and referencing so much, but how, do, how can we do a deep dive and then a deeper dive into these particular uh, moments. Also, and I'll end with this about just what we gain from biography. We could look at moments of change. We could really see indivi through individuals, we could really see moments of change. I think Mickey Leland coming out of the civil rights and black power movements, coming out of the student movements and going into electoral politics and, and looking at how Southern Africa became the consensus issue on foreign policy for African Americans and how that gave them certain leverage. It's, a, it's an in-between moment, right? And so uh, it's, we're on the cusp of Africa not being as significant in, in the ways in which African-Americans engage in politics, particularly foreign affairs, right? He's on the cusp of African-Americans gaining great electoral strength and power within the Democratic Party. He didn't live to see what's gonna happen. Uh, he's on the cusp of this, this rise of neoliberalism in American politics. And he's also, also on the cusp of this, the dissension of the international left. So individuals and in groups that he is in solidarity with and that inspired him coming even from the early 20th century. It's on the decline. There are very few governments that really grab onto a real leftist political agenda. And so the leftist politics that he espouses and the leftist solidarity that he espoused was on the decline. So we can see these turning points. We can see this cut, these cusp issues, I think effectively through individuals. And that's why I felt like biography was just useful in this instance. So I moved from being a very narrow look at his life to being a more capacious look at the moment that shaped him and the moment in which he lived. Terrific. Thank you. Ryan, um, Thomas Sankara is a name that I had never heard of. He's a man I was not familiar with until I was introduced to you. Mm -hmm. um, his, his life, it's larger than life. It is an incredible story. It's like a, uh, he's like a Marvel comic book character who happens to be a radical and a Marxist and at age 33 becomes president. Um, talk to us. How did you, again, how did you get, the, how was the decision made that you were going to write a biography of this man? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the decision. I mean, it, it, it took some time to, uh, to develop. I mean, honestly, I, I, it was um, pretty aleatory and unplanned until pretty late in the process. I mean, I, I had always been an admirer of, of Sankara. Um, didn't really see myself as being particularly interested in writing a biography, to be honest with you. Um, trained as a social and political historian, I, I didn't really read that many biographies unless they were related to my field. Um, and But I finished the first book, sort of along the lines of what Ben was talking about there, sort of the dissertation book, uh, very field work intensive based on oral history. It was a study of uh, rural Islamization processes in, in Southern Mali during the colonial period. And so, you know, I wanted to extend that that project, that story, into the post-colonial period and look at you know Islam from the 1960s through the 1990s in Mali, doing oral history in small villages in southern Mali for the most part. That was the methodology, and you know Mali fell into crisis in 2012. Uh, there was a coup, there's jihadist insurgency, and all that, and it forced me to sort of you know, figure out another project. And so I began looking over at Burkina Faso and thinking about doing a sort of a grassroots study of, of revolution. That's what I was initially planning on doing. And I wanted to see just how far, you know, the revolution um, you know, really penetrated into rural areas, you know, what it looked like, how it was understood. 
Um, and so, so I had those sort of research methods in mind in terms of doing oral history, you know, grassroots you know, study of revolution. And you know, I went over there to Burkina Faso, uh, traveled around, started doing oral history. And the more I spoke with people, you know, the more my research just was sort of you know, veered in the direction of Sankara. I mean, it, was, it just seemed unavoidable. I mean, people were always talking about Sankara and I decided to change tack and just and to write a book specifically um, about him. Uh, there, was, there was nothing in English at the time, uh, virtually nothing aside from his book of speeches. And so, um, you know, after a few months of, of doing that, I, I shifted to writing a biography. And so you know, I find myself now as a biographer without really setting out to, to be one. Um, and, but to the question of radical biography, I mean, I think that then, you know, there's addressing the silence in the history. Um, so my goal was to bring Sankar's complete story to an English speaking audience. Um, and actually, you know, the silence, I mean, it reflects um, sort of a wider problem in African history and African studies. And we just don't really have that many sort of good biographies of African presidents, I mean, at least aside from Nelson Mandela. So, so political biography has often been neglected in post-colonial history. And so that was, you know, one of the contributions I had in mind when I finally decided to shift in the direction of, of doing a biography of, of Thomas Sankara. Um, oh, let, me, let me stop there, actually. Okay, terrific. Um, let's talk a, briefly, very briefly about the archives. I mean, we have four biographies and your source base was, was very different. Um, Teresa, you worked with oral history. Um, were there other, did, did, did you, what did you gain? What did you lose by focusing on oral history as the major source base for your, for your biography? Well, um, as I, I point out in the book, it's, Mia not only had her own story, she had brought with her from Poland or through um, in uh, Italy, a whole bunch of uh, archives. She had her father and um, her brother were taken to Soviet work camps and they were uh, up by the White Sea in Siberia. And they wrote letters uh, and they got to um, her mother uh, through an intermediary. They went, the letters went from sometimes from the Soviet Union to Milan, from Milan to a relative, uh, a woman in uh, Poland. Mia's mother would see those letters and sometimes she would send them on to Mia in Rome. And what's very odd about this is the mail actually got through, um, sometimes a little slow, but it got through. Mia's mother stayed in Warsaw, as I mentioned, and she stayed on the Aryan side. And she wrote to Mia throughout the war. Um, and Mia got those letters through another intermediary in Rome. And those letters are all in Polish in tiny, tiny, tiny little script. And they're also written in code, a lot of different codes. So uh, Polish words, like the word for the shed fell down. And Mia said, I began to understand that that meant that somebody uh, was taken to the ghetto. And, and she had a whole kind of code that they had worked out. Now, I don't read any Polish. And so... That's why I didn't feel that I could do the kind of biography that felt that was the whole historical background. Um, and so I did the oral history, but I make reference very often to the fact that there was this, all of these, um, all of these uh, letters. And I met at one point with a, a really great historian of Poland, John Connolly, who's at UC Berkeley. And uh, he was lucky, he came to Mia's house, he met her and he looked at the letters and these things were quite valuable. And I, I said, well, I, what 
maybe you've got a graduate student that would like to do all this. And he said, well, you know, you can get a translator and see if you can do some. So I was never able to um, get those letters um, tra totally translated, but I hired a translator who sat with Mia at her table in her apartment in, in Berkeley. And she told all of the stories and she tried to decipher all of the letters of those she could. And I took it all down on tape. Um, in addition to that, there were other members of the family who had been in the ghetto, um, and after the war, they gave testimony, that, and these testimonies are, are held in the uh, archives in, in uh, Warsaw, you probably know that, and I think, David, you work with them too, um, and some of them were translated and some of them were not, and so I hired translators um, to tell me what was life like in the ghetto for these relatives of Mia's, who eventually also came to the United States. Some people died, but they also had left some records. So along with these stories, I do have an incredible archive, and I want that archive to go somewhere, and I have been in conversation with uh, a couple of uh, major places. So Mia's story and my book about her, as well as all of those tapes, will be added to the, all of these uh, letters and, and diaries. She also uh, sold, as I said, all these crazy, some of these wigs and all, crazy things to these Italians, mostly because they had a lot of money and, and they were fascists a lot. You know, they, the only people who had any money in Italy at the time were the fascists. And so Mia had to have some money and she would sell things to them, but she took pictures of them and she kept drawings. And so she really created her own archive. Yeah. And somebody who knows a lot more of the language than I do will, you know, benefit from it. Manu, I have a, a different question. Um, I, I'm fascinated by how you, this is something that's always intrigued me and, and that I don't know if I've ever gotten it right. How do you balance, how do you connect the private life, the political life, and the public life of your character? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's a, it's, I can only give you a cliche as an answer. It's a bit, it's a bit like walking a tightrope. You know, you have to, it, you're constantly, constantly balancing all of these things. Um, but if you get it right, you know, if, and, and there, uh, my, my book is still in progress, uh, nearing completion, but it's not done yet. Um, so I can only go back and look at look at the things I've written in passages and certain passages, you know, you sort of feel like it's it, it, it's singing back to you a little bit. And, and that's how I sort of sense that I think this is this is um, on the right track. You uh, um, actually, David, truthfully, I, I think I, I used a bit of a method that you you did in um, the patriarch, um, uh, which is you. You write in these sections, and you can, if you if you um, create the flow correctly, you can sort of bounce from here's something that's taking place, and this is a big political moment, and then it's a break, and then in the next thing, you're she's going through something in her private life, which is in the same moment, and then you sort of tell the story of this private thing, which is interrelated with the other thing, but it sort of sets sets it apart. And um, I, I found this trick sort of works really well. Um, or I think it does anyway, so, so far. Um, and I, truthfully, I think I learned it from you. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, for, I have a, for, for Brian and Benjamin, I have another sort of a question. What, how can I put this? What's the legacy? Let's start with Benjamin. D does Mickey Leland, um, I mean, your, your biography, one hopes, will introduce him to people who don't know him. But is, is there a legacy? If I were to go to Houston today um, and talk to a high school class, um, or talk to activists there, would they know, have they gained something from mm -hmm. the work that Leland did? Mm -hmm. Right, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, when you go to Houston and you say Mickey Leland's name, unlike any other city outside of Washington, D.C. and Addis Ababa, they know him. Everyone knows Mickey Leland. There's a, a wing of the airport named after him. There are high schools named after him. Streets named after him. 
middle school named after him. So people know Mickey Leland. Similarly, in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, if I say Mickey Leland, people know Mickey Leland. Oh, cool. I think part of it is part of his legacy is that he was to the people who lived among him, even if they didn't know him, he was a real person. That's it's a very changed era of politics and political engagement. He wasn't just constantly running for office. He wasn't just using sound bites. He wasn't uh, just constantly raising money. He wasn't just uh, towing the party line. He was really speaking uh, uh, about the the needs and aspirations of his constituency, or, or as he interpreted, as he interpreted them. Now, granted, he did see his constituency as all those who are in need around the world. That's, that's what he said. So those who are in need are those are my people. Um, but he, the legacy is really just grassroots politicians, people who live and work in the community who are working for the people. So he's a, he's a model in that respect. Also, it's a legacy of solidarity building. He's building solidarity between the African-American and Latino community in Texas. That was his goal. Building solidarity among poor and working class people around the world. Building solidarity between political organizations around the world. Standing in solidarity with people who are on the side of the people is, is, is was, was what, what he strove for. And so I, I really think that's his legacy. Also being internationally minded. There no, there's no such thing as local politics. Really, there's no such thing as domestic politics. Everything's, everything's international and global. Things that are global matter to the local, and things that are local matter globally. And so he was the, he was the, really the embodiment of that, and that's his legacy. But if you don't mind, I want to steal T Teresa's question because I find it interesting. I won't take time; just, just a minute. I like this idea of, of the archive it is very important. I'll let Brian jump in on 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 the legacy question. But I had a I had a treasure trove. I said at the outset I had a treasure trove of documents from Leland's own personal papers. And I really, and he was involved in so much, I really had to choose what I was going to do. So I just focused on, the, on his, his interest in Africa and to a lesser extent, the Caribbean and his commentary on, on leftist movements and regimes around the world. But I didn't want the voice just to be his because I'm writing about his involvement with Africans. I had to allow Africans to speak back. And so how do you do that when I really didn't have a lot of sources from them? There weren't, you know, there wasn't a lot of paper on those who are in feeding camps in Northern Ethiopia, how can we get in their voice? These are the people he's trying to um, address. South Africa is a little different with the anti-apartheid movement. It was easy to bring those voices. I don't speak on politics, so one, uh, the, the dominant language of uh, this part of Ethiopia, along with Tigrinya, is what I did is I, I used translations of Ethiopian poetry about famine, about hunger, about the food crisis, and try to incorporate that into my, my interpretation of their experiences, along with newspaper accounts. I also traveled to Ethiopia, try to get a sense of, go into these places where they had these mass camps that we saw famously on TV to see what, I know it's different uh, in the 2000s than it was in the 1980s, but just get a sense of what, what it looked like. What's the scale and scope of these places? What does the air feel like? What does it smell like? What, did, what, what it might've sounded like? And to try to just appreciate the, the feel of the place. How hot is it, right? Or, or how cold at night to write, to write that into it. So I tried to, Although the voice, the dominant experience is Mickey Leland, I'm trying to capture a multiplicity of voices and experiences. So try to think creatively about the archive and what constitutes an archive. Terrific. Um, Brian, there's just, you know, pick up on anything you want in the, the conversation, the archive. Sure. Like, um, yeah, I mean, just, just you know, when, when Sankara was, um, assassinated October 15, 1987, um, you know, the military strongman who took power, Blaise Compare, you know, he really sought to destroy Sankara's legacy, um, tried to erase him from history. Um, I mean, the security forces raided his home, um, the homes of his family members, his friends, and, you know, they took everything, letters, documents, his photos, his books, his record collection, everything. Um, so there was no real, uh, paper trail left behind memoirs diary you know letters things like that you know so 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 it was challenging i think you know writing a biography you know without that sort of normal uh, toolkit um and then plus on car in sankar's case i mean he was a murder head of state which further complicated matters because the guy who orchestrated his murder was still in power and so that meant that there's virtually nothing in the, the the national archives in burkina faso or in the french archives for that matter um, so like Teresa, uh, I ended up doing a lot of interviews um, and it wasn't just those in his Sankara's inner circle. It was um, all sorts of different social actors, uh, people 
who are obviously in his inner circle, but also diplomats, activists, you know, soldiers, workers, peasants, students, uh, teachers, all sorts of different people. And so that provided me with a, a wide range of views on Sankara, which I think was really important because I was dealing with someone who emerged as a revolutionary symbol, as an almost sort of mythic figure. Um, and, um, you know, and another thing about sources is that, you know, I interviewed a, a former U.S. ambassador to Burkina who suggested I do a, a FOIA request. And so I did that. And to my surprise, you know, all these U.S. embassy cables from all over the world, you know, tagged with material on Sankara, they'd been classified, but were suddenly declassified and started showing up at my, at my doorstep in nice little packages. And so, so those complemented the oral record um, as well. And you know, shed more light on sort of the geopolitical uh, context of his revolution um, in terms of the sources. I wanted to just say one thing that I had also not heard of Thomas Sankara. And although Brian, uh, who's my colleague at Union College, has said that he was the Che Guevara of, of Africa. And then I was in Barcelona and walked into a bookstore there, a left-wing bookstore, and uh, they had various children's books. And I bought you one, is it in English? But I had the choice of getting it in Spanish, in Catalan, in French. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what all. And they had a whole shelf there of Thomas Sankara for the children. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a part of the legacy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, the legacy is, is, yeah, that's part of the story. I mean, when, when the new regime um, took power, I mean, they basically outlawed photos, stories, any public references to Sankara. Um, you know, but the people, you know, pushed back. I mean, they kept him alive, you know, in their minds and their memories. Um, and, and then later in the next generation, you had the expansion of the internet, social media platforms, all that stuff. And so you saw this proliferation of sunk car material suddenly, um, videos, uh, online speeches, obviously images and things like that. So you had this whole new transnational uh, generation that was turned on to his ideas um, and a protest movement picked up in Burkina Faso. And you had, you know, images of Sankara all over the place and posters and t-shirts and such. And so, you know, his biography, his life, you know, his visage, I mean, was the centerpiece of contemporary political struggles in Burkina Faso. It eventually led to an insurrection, led to the overthrow of Blaise Compaore in October 2014. Um, you know, so you saw this incredible sort of poetic justice uh, in Compaore's overthrow by the youth wearing Sankara t-shirts. In fact, the, 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 the trial of Sankara's killers uh, is going on right now. In fact, it just restarted today. So, it's, so history is, is, is ongoing in the Sankara story. I think, I, think, I, think, I think Brian does more than that with his, with, with his biography, though, because there is that legacy. But what I love about Brian's book is that he complicates the legacy. There's this inspiration of Sankara that, you know, raising a, raising a, holding aloft the banner of Sankara for these, these movements. Mm -hmm. But for most of it, I came into it thinking I knew a lot about Sankara, but Brian disabused me of that notion. And the idea was that the revolution died when they killed Sankara. But Brian, Brian, because this book is not just about Sankara, but about Burkina Faso and this revolution, but he shows that the revolution was fraught and floundering a bit even before he, even before he was assassinated. So it doesn't, it's not as if he takes the veneer off of the heroicism and the, the, mm -hmm. the revolutionary spirit of Sankara, but just complicates this narrative in ways that I think are generative and important. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that. Go That's on, a, Then. No, I was just going to say that. Yeah, I mean, as an historian, I, I, I sort of was grappling with this question of um, how much to focus on the present and the contemporary political struggles. I mean, I, I obviously very soon quickly figured out that there was a usable past story going on there in terms of the activist appropriation of Sankara. And I, I spent a lot of time trying to separate the man from the myth, you know, the revolutionary icon. I thought that's what good biographers did is to find the real story until finally I just relented, decided to just incorporate both these aspects of political biography, you know, studying the historical figure and this posthumous uh, icon of resistance, which I found very instructive in, to, in, in incorporating into the study. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to ask Manu, if right, David, can I just oh go ahead, go ahead ask your question. Go on, you you go first. Well, I just was struck by the ob this this observation about Sankara's power after his death, which strikes me as an afterlife. This is the afterlife of Thomas Sankara. But then, more broadly speaking, 
what we're doing when we when we write biographies is excavating lives. We're telling the story of lives of figures or of things that have that have uh, traversed um, time and space. But um, it strikes me that what we're also doing in crafting biography is sort of working on this afterlife. That that they that the ways in which these powerful figures speak to times after they have left and then our time as well. Our biographies not only help them to live again, but are also about sort of their engagement with the present um, uh, and, and um, therefore are, a very, are, are part of the life narrative as well. I mean, the, it's the life and afterlife and maybe the ever afterlife uh, of these figures. Well, what, talk about the, the afterlife of, of your subject. She, too, was the subject of a deliberate attempt to erase her from history. Um, did it succeed? Yes. So she, uh, as I mentioned, helped bring down her niece, Indira Gandhi, um, during the period of the you know, following the emergency. But Indira Gandhi returned to power in 1980. Um, and she really held a grudge. Uh, and so she went about very purposefully um, erasing her from you know, sort of scrubbing her from the books and the narrative and, and everything. Uh, she, the, the, she became a persona non grata and just you know, it sort of eliminated from the Indian side. Um, as far as why her memory fades from abroad, I mean, she's an international figure and she's very well known. Um, I mean, I'd say any of us would be relatively speaking hard pressed to name diplomats today or, or sort of people working in international affairs um, other, than, other than heads of state, states perhaps. But so she was really well known. I mean, taxi drivers knew who she, wa who she was and, and really admired her everyday people in the United States or in my, and, uh, other parts of the world um, sort of really celebrated her. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, once she sort of left those positions and, and, and went back into sort of other kinds of spheres of activities, um, you know, I think uh, time moves quickly and, and uh, recollections of those things quickly receded. Um, and so there's a, there's, a fog, there's a sort of memory fog of the past for figures like this. And then there's the purposeful erasure and both these things are going on in her case. Yeah. The... Um, let me ask just, you know, one last question. I asked it earlier and nobody wanted to answer it. Um, are any of you, Manu's not finished yet, so we'll exempt him from this question. <laughs> but the three of you, you um, do you want to write another biography? Have you been, did, how can I put it? When you decided you were going to write a biography, did you find that process very different, more exciting, less exciting than the political histories or the social histories or the movement histories you had written before that? And will there be another biography for any of the three of you? Teresa, you want to begin? Well, um... I don't think another biography, um, because this one seemed to came about when I was trying to write a different kind of book. So sometimes I think I have to get back to that, that book that I, I wanted to write before. I learned so much from doing this biography, and this is a, a little bit of a segue, about a part of the world about people that I knew nothing about. And I found that really exciting. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that was very interesting is that Mia was adamant, uh, she was kind of a Polish nationalist. She believed that Poland had been oppressed. It had been divided up by its neighbors. And, and she was kind of a person walking around in the United States with this Jewish past who was saying, but Poland was so um, defeated. And that didn't sit well with a lot of my audience. And uh, so one of the things that I wanted to bring up, it is not just that somebody is lost, you know, or that some individual person like Madame Panda was lost or, or Thomas Sankara 
it's that the process of idealization or the process of rewriting history is one thing that writing a biography uncovers. The things aren't exactly the way that they are mythologized to be later on. And um, I think I'd like to write more about that and not about an individual. Brian? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think at this juncture, um, I want to just keep working on Sankara for a while. Um, there's a lot of material, oral histories and the FOIA documents, a lot of stuff that that is on the cutting room floor that, that I didn't get to use uh, that I want to um, use in writing some articles about uh, Sankara's political thought, um, academic articles. And I'm thinking about doing a book on the assassination, just a shorter book, just focused specifically on that. Now that the trial is going to be wrapping up in the next couple months and we'll get a more complete story. Uh, and and then I'm thinking about, you know, something, a project dealing with the 1980s in, in West Africa and the Sahel famine. Um, I think it's a, it's a period in history that's rather unexplored. So kind of fleshing out the world in which uh, Sankara inhabited during the 1980s and especially West Africa and the Sahel during the drought of, of that period. So that's what I have in mind, yeah. Okay, Benjamin? I will write. I, I will write another biography. Not not next. Not next. I have next on star. Really writing the the biography of an idea. I'm looking at nonviolence as it lived in the lives of uh, various activists. So it's kind of using this idea, but it's it's the lives of these individuals. So it's it's kind of biography in there, but it's really about about this idea and the efficacy of of nonviolence coming out of the 1930s into into the anti-apartheid movement. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Later, I'll write another one. I'll come. I'll come back to it, though. I'll come back to it. Back. One more. One more book down. Maybe I'll, I'll come back to biography. Okay. I want to um, close by telling our audience members that they can and should get a hold of these four, four three remarkable biographies, and a fourth to come soon. Um, all you have to do is go to bookshop.com and look up Talton, T-A-L-T-O-N, Peterson, O-N, Mead, M-E-A-D-E, and Manu's book will be out within the year and will get such extraordinary attention that everyone will be able to find it. I wanna thank our remarkable panelists I want to thank Teresa for putting this together for us. I want to thank Kai, Bird, and Thad. And I want to thank the Leon Levy Center and Shelby White for her generous sponsorship of the Leon Levy Center and of this event. And I thank you all. And thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.